Hello there, thank you for clicking on this video. Your time is valuable, so we are super grateful that you are giving our little channel a chance. Any feedback is appreciated. Enjoy the story. The War of the World by A. J. Wells Chapter 9 The Fighting Begins Saturday lives in my memory as the day of suspense. It was a day of lazy to do hot and close with untold a rapid fluctuating parameter. I had slept but little, though my wife had succeeded in sleeping and I rose early. I went into my garden before breakfast and stood listening, but towards the common there was nothing stirring but a lark. The milkman came as usual, heard the rattle of his carrier and I went around to the side gate to ask the latest news. He told me that during the night the Martians had been surrounded by troops and that guns were expected. Then a familiar, reassuring note, I heard a train running towards walking. They are to be killed, said the milkman, if that can be possibly avoided. I saw my neighbor gardening, chatted with him for a time and then strolled into breakfast. It was a most unexceptional morning. My neighbor was of opinion that the troops would be able to capture or to destroy the Martians during the day. It is a pity they make themselves so unapproachable, he said. It would be curious to know how they live on another planet, we might learn a thing or two. He came up to the fence and extended a handful of strawberries, for his gardening was as generous as it was enthusiastic. At the same time, he told me of burning the pine wood about the Bifley Coughling. They say, he said, that there is another of these blessing things falling there, number two, but once and up, sure, these lots will cost the insurance people a pity penny before everything settles. He laughed with an air of the greatest good humor as he said this. The wood, he said, was still burning and pointed out a head of smoke to me. They will be hot underfoot for days, on account of the thick soil of pine needles and turf, he said, and then grew serious over poor Ogilvy. After breakfast, instead of working, I decided to walk down towards the common. Under the rail bridge, I found a group of soldiers, suppers, I think, men in a small round cap, dirty red jackets unbuttoned, and showing their blue shirts, dark trousers and boots coming to the calf. They told me no one was allowed over the channel, and looking along the road towards the bridge, I saw one of the cardigan men standing sentinel there. I talked with these soldiers for a time. I told them of my sights of the Martian on the previous evening. None of them had seen the Martians, and they had but the vaguest idea of them. So they plied me with questions. They said that they did not know who had authorized the movement of the troops. Their idea was that a dispute had arisen at the horse guards. The ordinary supper is a great deal better educated than the common soldier, and they discussed the peculiar condition of the possible fight with some acuteness. I described the heat ray to them, and they began to argue among themselves. Growl and undercover and rush him, say I, said one. Get out, said another. What cover against these airy sticks to cook air? What we got to do is go as near as the ground will let us, and then drive a trench. Blow your trenches. You always want trenches. You ought to have been born in a rabbit snappy. Hey, they got any necks then? said the third abruptly, a little contemplated dark man smoking a pipe. I repeated my description. Octopus, he said, that's what I will call them. Talk about fishers of men, fighters of fish it is this time. It ain't no murder killing beasts like this, said the first speaker. Why not shell the darn things straight off and finish them, said the little dark man. You can tell what they might do. Where is your shells, said the first speaker. There is ain't no time. To do it rush, that's my tip, and to do it at once. So they discussed it. After a while I left them and went on the rail station to get as many morning papers as I could. But we will not weary the readers with the description of that long morning and of the long afternoon. I did not succeed in getting glimpse of the common, for even horse and chapman church towers were in the hands of the military authorities. 
The soldiers I addressed did not know anything. The officers were mysteriously as well as busy. I found people in the town quite secured again in the presence of the military, and I heard for the first time from the marshal that his son was among the dead of the common. The soldiers made the people on the outskirts of Horsewell walk up and leave their houses. I got back to lunch about two, very tired for, as I had said, the day was extremely hot and dull, and in order to refresh myself I took a cold bath in the afternoon. About half past four I went up to the railway station to get an evening paper, for the morning papers had continued only a very inaccurate descriptions of the killing of Stan, Henderson, Ogilvy and the others, but there was little I didn't know. The Martians did not show an inch of themselves, they seemed busy in their pit, and there was a sound of hammering and almost a continuous streamer of smoke. Apparently, they were busy getting ready for struggle. Fresh at them have been made to signal, but without success, was the stereotype formula of the paper. A supper told me it was done by a man in a ditch with a flag on a long pole. The Martian took as much notice of such advance as we should of the lowing of a cow. I must confess, the sight of all this preparation greatly excited me. My imagination became belligerent and defeated the invaders in dozen striking ways. Something of my schoolboy dreams of battle and heroism came back. It hardly seemed a fair fight to me at that time. They seemed very helpless in that pit of theirs. About three o'clock, there began the third of guns at measured intervals from Chelsea and Addleston. I learned that the smoldering pine wood into which the second cylinder had fallen was being shielded in the hope of destroying that object before it opened. It was only about five, however, that the field gun reached Chapham for use against the first body of Martians. About six in the evening, as I sat at tea with my wife in the summer house talking vigorously about the battle that was lowering upon us, I heard a muffled detonation from the common, and immediately after, a gust of firing. Close on the heels of that came a violent rattling crash quite close to us that shook the ground and starting out upon the lawn I saw the tops of the trees about the oriental college burst into smoky red flames and the tower of the little church beside it slid down into ruin. The pinnacle of the mosque had vanished and the roof line of the college itself looked as if a hundred ton gun had been at work upon it. One of our chimneys cracked as if a shot had hit it, flew and a piece of it came cluttering down the tiles and made a heap of broken red fragments upon the flower bed of my study window. I and my wife stood amazed, then I realized that the crest of Maybury Hill must be within the range of the Martians hit ray now that the college was cleared out of the way. At that I gripped my wife's arm and without ceremony ran her out into the road. Then I fetched out the servant, telling her I would go upstairs myself for the box she was clamoring for. We can possibly stay here, I said, and as I spoke the firing reopened for a moment upon the common. But where are we to go? said my wife in terror. I thought perplexed. Then I remembered her cousins at Leatherhead. Leatherhead, I shouted above the sudden noise. She looked away from me downhill. The people were coming out of their houses, astonished. How are we to go to Leatherhead? she said. Down the hill I saw a bevy of hussars ride under the railway bridge. Three galloped through the open gate of the Oriental College. Two others dismounted and began running from house to house. The sun shining through the smoke that drove up from the top of the trees seemed bloody red and threw unfamiliar blurred light upon everything. Stop here, I said. You are safe here and I started off at once for the spotted dog, for I knew the landlord had a horse and dog cart. I ran, for perceived that in a moment everyone upon this side of the will be moving. I found him in his bar, quite unaware of what was going on behind his house. A man stood with his back to me, talking to him. I must have a pound, said the landlord, and I have no one to drive it. I will give you two, said I, over the stranger's shoulder. What for? and I will bring it back by midnight, he said. Lord, said the landlord, what's the hurry? I'm selling my bit of a pig two pounds and you'll bring it back. What's going on now? 
I explained hastily that I had to leave my home and so secure the dog car. At the time did not seem to me nearly so urgent that the landlord should leave his. I took care to have the cart there and then drove it off down the road and leaving it in charge of my wife and servant rushed into my house and packed a few valuables, such plate as we had and so forth. The beech tree below the house were burning while I did this and the palanquins up the road blew red. While I was occupied in this way, one of the dismounted hussars came running up. He was going from house to house warning people to leave. He was going on as I came out of my front door, lugging my treasures, done up in a tablecloth. I shouted after him, What's news? He turned, stared, bowed something about crawling out in a thing like this cover and run on the gate of the house at the crest. A sudden whirl of black smoke driving across the road hit him for a moment. I ran to my neighbor's door and ripped to satisfy myself of what I already knew, that his wife had gone to London with him and had locked up their house. I went in again according to my promise to get my servant's box, lurched it out, tapped it beside her on the tail of the dog cart and then caught the reins and jumped up into the driver's seat beside my wife. In another moment we were clear of the smoke and noise and spunking down the opposite slope of Mulberry Hill towards Old Walking. In front was a quite sunny landscape, a wheat field ahead on either side of the road, and the Mulberry Inn with a swinging sign. I saw the doctor's cart ahead of me. At the bottom of the hill I turned my head to look at the hillside I was living. The thick streamer of black smoke shot with threads of red fire were driving up in the still air and throwing dark shadows upon the green treetops eastward. The smoke already extended far away to the east and west, to the Byfleet Pinewood eastwards and to walking on the west. The road was dotted with people running toward us, and very faint now, but very distinct through the hot white air one heard the swirl of machine gun that was presently still, and the intermittent cracking of rifles. Apparently the Martians were setting fire to everything with range of their heat ray. I am not an expert driver and I had immediately to turn my attention to the horse. When I looked back again, the second hill had hidden the black smoke. I slashed the horse with the whip and gave him a loose rein until walking and sent lay between us and that quivering tumult. I overtook and passed the doctor between walking and sand. Chapter 10 In the Storm Leatherhead is about 12 miles from Maybury Hill. The scent of hay was in the air through the lush meadow beyond Pilfort, and the hedges on either side were sweet and gay with multitude of dock roses. The heavy firing that had broken out while we were driving down Maybury Hill ceased as abruptly as it began, leaving the evening very peaceful and still. We got to Leatherhead without misadventures about 9 o'clock and horse had an hour rest while I took supper with my cousin and commanded my wife to their care. My wife was curiously silent through the drive and seemed oppressed with foreboding of evil. I talked to her reassuringly, pointing out that the Martians were tied to the pit by the sheer heaviness and the utmost could be crowd a little out of pit, but she answered only in monosyllables. Had not been for a promise to the innkeeper, she would, I think, have urged me to stay in the leather hat that night. Would that I had. Her face, I remember, was very white as we parted. For my own part, I had been feverishly excited all day. Something very like the war fever that occasionally runs throughout a civilized community had gone into my blood. And in my heart, I was not so very sorry that I had to return to Melbury that night. I was even afraid that last fusillade I had heard might mean the extermination of our invaders from Mars. I can best express my state of mind by saying that I wanted to be in it at the death. It was nearly 11 when I started to return. The night was unexpectedly dark. To me, walking out of the light passage of my cousin's house, it seemed indeed black, and it was as hot and close as the day. Overhead the clouds were driving fast, albeit not the bread steering the shrubs about me. My cousin's men lit both lamps. Happily, I knew the road immediately, 
My wife stood in the light of the doorway and watched me until I jumped up into the dog car. Then abruptly she turned and went in, leaving my cousin side by side, wishing me good luck. I was a little depressed at first with the contagious of my wife's fears, but very soon my thoughts reverted to the Martians. At that time I was absolutely in the dark as the course of the evening's fighting. I did not know even the circumstances that had precipitated the conflict. As I came through Ockham, for that was the way I returned and not through the sand and odd walking, I saw along the west horizon the blood red glow which, as I drew near, crept slowly up the sky. The driven clouds of the gathering thunderstorm mingled there with the masses of black and red smoke. Ripley Street was deserted, and except for the lighted windows, or so the village showed no the sign of life. But I narrowly escaped an incident at the corner of the road to Pierfall, where a knot of people stood with their backs to me. They said nothing to me as I passed. I did not know what they knew of the things happening beyond the hill, nor I do know if the silent houses I passed on my way were sleeping securely, or deserted and empty, or harassed and watching against the terror of the night. From Ripley until I came through Pierfort, I was in the valley of the A, and the red glow was hidden from me. As I ascended in the little hill beyond Pierfort Church, the glare came into the view and the trees about me shivered with the first intimidation of the storm that was upon me. Then I heard me now peeling out from the P4 church behind me, and then came the silhouette of Maybury Hill, with its tree tops and roofs black and sharp against the red. Even as beheld, this lurid green glare lit the road about me and showed the distant wood towards Adelstone. I felt a tug at the rain. I saw that the driving clouds had been piercing, as it were by a threat of green fire, suddenly lightening their confusion and falling into the field to my left. It was the third falling star. Close on its apparition the, and blindingly violent by contrast danced out the first lightning of the gathering storm and the thunder burst like a rocket overhead. The horse took the bite between his teeth and bolted. A moderate incline runs towards the foot of the Maybury Hill, and down this we clattered. Once the lightning had begun, it went on as in a rapid succession of flashes as I ever had seen. The thunderclaps, treading one on the hill of another with a strange crackling accompaniment, sounded more like the work of a gigantic electrical machine than the usual detonating reverberation. The flickering light was blinding and confusing, and a thin hail smote ghastly at my face as I drove down the slope. At first I regarded little but the road before me, and then abruptly my attention was arrested by something that was moving rapidly down the opposite slope of Melbury Hill. At first I took it for the wet roof of a house, but one flash following another showed it to be a swift rolling movement. It was elusive vision, a moment of bewildering darkness, and then, in a flash like daylight, the red masses of the orphanage near the crest of the hill, the green tops of the pine trees, and this problematic object came out clear and sharp and bright. And this thing I saw, how can I describe it? A monstrous tripod, higher than many houses, striding over the young pine trees and smashing them aside in its carrier. A walking engine of glittering metal striding now across the heater, articulated drops of steel dangling from it and the clattering tumults of its passage mingling with the riot of the thunders. A flash and it came out vividly, healing over one way with two feet in the air, to vanish and reappear almost instantly as it seemed with the next flash hundred yards nearer. Can you imagine a milking stool tilted and bowed violently along the ground? That was the impression those instant flashes gave, but instead of milking stool, imagine it a great body of machinery on a tripod stand. Then suddenly the trees in the pine wood ahead of me were parted, as brittle wreaths are parted by a man thrusting through them. They were snapped off and driven headlong, and a second huge tripod appeared rushing, as it seems, headlong toward me, and I was galloping hard to meet it, 
At the sight of the second monster, my nerves went all together, no stopping to look again. I wrenched the horse's head hard round to the right and in another moment the dog cart had heeled over upon the horse. The shaft smashed noisily and I was flung sideways and fell heavily into a shallow pool of water. I crawled out almost immediately and encroached my feet still in the water under a clump of firs. The horse lay motionless, his neck was broken, poor brute, and by the lightning flashes I saw the black bulk of the overturned dog cart and the silhouette of the wheel still spinning slowly. In another moment, the colossal mechanism went striding by me and passed uphill towards Pifford. Seen nearer, the thing was incredibly strange, but it was no mere sent machine driving on its way. Machine it was, with a ringing metallic pace and long, flexible, glittering tentacles, one of which grabbed a young pine tree, swinging and rattling about its strange body. It picked its roll as it went striding along, and the brazen hood that surmounted it moved to and from with the inevitable suggestion of head looking about. Behind the main body was a huge mass of white metal like a giant fisherman's basket, and poof of green smoke squirted out from the joint of the limbs as the monster swept by me, and in an instant it was gone. So much I saw that all vaguely for the flickering of the lightning in blinding highlights and dense black shadows. As it passed it, set up an exultant defining howl that drowned the thunder. Allo, allo! And in another minute it was with its companion, half a mile away, stooping over something in the field. I had no doubt this thing in the field was the third of three cylinders that they had fired at us from Mars. For some minutes I lay there in the rain and darkness watching by the intermittent light, these monstrous beings of metal moving about in the distance over the hedge tops. A thin hair was now beginning, and as it came and went, their figures grow mist and then flashed into clearness again. Now and then came a gap in the lightning, and the night swallowed them up. I was soaked with hell above and puddle water below. It was some time before my blank astonishment would let me struggle up the bank to a drier position, or thinking at all of my imminent peril. Not far from me was a little one room quarter hut of wood surrounded by a patch of potato garden. I struggled to my feet at last, and, crouching and making use of every chance of cover, I made a run for this. I hammered at the door, but I could not make the people hear if there were any people inside, and after a time I desisted and evaded myself of a ditch for the greater part of the way, succeeded in crawling, unobserved by these monstrous machines, into the pine woods towards Maybury. Under cover of this I pushed on, wet and shivering now, towards my own house. I walked along the trees trying to find the footpath. It was very dark indeed in the wood, for the lightning was now becoming infrequent and the hail, which was pouring down in a torrent, fell in columns throughout the gaps in the heavy foliage. If I had fully realized the meaning of all these things I had seen, I should have immediately worked my way round through by fleet and streak of home, and so gone back to rejoin my wife at Letterhead. But that night the strangest of the things about me and my physical wretchedness prevented me. For I was bruised, wear wet to the skin, defeated and blinded by the storm. I had a vague idea of going on my own house, and that was as much motivated as I had. I staggered through the trees, fell into a ditch, and bruised my knees against the plank, and finally splashed out into the lane that ran down from the college arbs. I saw splashed, for the storm water was sweeping the sand down the hill in a muddy torrent. There in the darkness, a man blundered into me and sent me reeling back. I gave a cry of terror, sprang sideways and rushed on before I could gather my wits sufficiently to speak to him. So heavy was the stress of the storm just at this place that I had hardest task to win my way up the hill. I went close up to the fence on the left and worked my way along its pilings. Near the top I stumped upon something soft and by a flash of light I saw between my feet a heap of black broadcloth and pair of boots. 
And before I could distinguish clearly how the man lay, the flickers of light had passed. I stood over him waiting for the next flash. When it came, I saw that he was a sturdy man, cheaply but not shabbily dressed. His head was bent under his body, and he lay crumbled up close to the fence, as though he had been flung violently against it, overcoming the repugnant nature to one who had never been touched a dead body. I stood and turned him over to feel for his heart. He was quite dead. Apparently, his neck had been broken. The lightning flashed for the third time, his face leaped upon me. I sprang to my feet. It was the landlord of the spotty dog whose convenience I had taken. I stepped over him gingerly and pushed on the top of the hill. I made my way by the police station and the college arms towards my own house. Nothing was burning on the hillside, though from the common there still came a red glare and a rolling tumult of ruddy smoke beating up against the drenching hail. So far as I could see by the flashes, the houses about me were mostly uninjured. By the college arm a dark heap lay in the road. Down the road towards Melbury Bridge there was voices and sound of feet, but I had not the courage to shout or to go to them. I let myself in with my latch key, closed, locked and bolted the door, staggered to the foot of the staircase and sat down. My imagination was full of those striding metallic monsters and of the dead body smashed against the fence. I crouched at the foot of the staircase with my back to the wall shivering violently. This is the end of today's story. I hope that these past minutes helped you relax and ease you in falling asleep. If you are not 100% there yet, let us just do a breathing exercise. Count mentally with me your breath intakes and exhales. Concentrate on the count, nothing more. Intake 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and release for one, two, three, four. In for one, two, three, four, five, six. Out for one, two, three, four. Intake for one, two, three, four. 5, 6, and release for 1, 2, 3, 4, in for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, out for 1, 2, 3, 4, intake for 1, 2, Three, four, five, six, and release for one, two, three, four, in for one, two, three, four, five, six, out for one, two, three, four. Intake for one, two, three, four, five, six, and release for one, two, three, four, in for one, two, three, four, five, six, out for one. Two, three, four, in for one, two, three, four, five, six, out for one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two. 
three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three.